lying just north of Alta Floresta, the Cristalino Jungle Lodge is probably the most famous of Brazil's Amazonian lodges, and is accessed via its namesake, the Rio Cristalino. The main lodge buildings are in a clearing, set back from the river. More clearings host the guest chalets. As with all good lodges, plenty of birds can be found in the grounds. A male bare-faced curassow was a fairly regular visitor. It was almost constantly calling. A fruiting palm tree drew in a flock of Madeira parakeets. They're similar to other dark-headed parakeets found further north and east and are often lumped with Santarem parakeet. However, they have less blue on the forehead and are browner on the ear coverts and breast. They were attracted by the ripe fruits. At least one family was involved. However, the adults weren't about to give up the best fruits to the youngsters. The same tree also had a pair of golden-winged parakeets. A species we'd seen plenty of times before, but nearly always in flight. This male bare-necked fruit crow was one of a small flock behind the lodge. Nearby, a male black-eared fairy was in an area known as the Secret Garden. Plus a female fork-tailed wood nymph. A versicolored emerald completed a trio of hummingbirds here. Some green patterning on the throat and a typically greyish breast suggests it's a male. Down at the boat launch, lesser kiskadees were regular and probably nesting. Black-fronted nunbirds were frequently seen along the main track from here to the lodge, often around the lights where insects had been attracted at night. At the staff quarters was this roosting blackish nightjar. The dark plumage with a thin white band around the lower throat is diagnostic. Greater sack-winged bats were also roosting here, also known as white-lined sack-winged bats, due to the markings down their back. The main attraction at Cristalino, though, is its extensive network of trails, many of which are upriver and can only be accessed by boat. The first we visited was the Cacao Trail.
Part of the trail contains stands of bamboo. Home to a scarce chestnut-throated spinetail. Further along was an area of fallen trees, where we found a short-billed leaf tosser. They habitually forage on or near the ground, searching for arthropods. Not far away was this male Tapayos fire eye. A recent split from white backed fire eye. Differences are only apparent in the female. Followed by a scenarius mourner. and after a lengthy search, a screaming peer. Famously loud, but usually concealed. The trail was particularly good for mixed flocks, producing the likes of grey ant wren. a rufous rumped foliage gleaner. A lone palm tanager. A striking male Amazonian trogon. an exceptionally hard to see Spix's wood creeper. And a striped wood creeper. Towards the end of the trail, we found a Spix's guan, the typical guan of Amazonian lowlands. Further upriver was the Great Sierra Trail. Here we were at last able to get excellent views of a male snow-capped mannequin. Up until then we'd only heard and not seen them. They are well named, the head adorned with a prominent snowy white crown. A male black faced ant bird was equally conspicuous. whilst a male spot-backed ant bird was much more elusive. As was a male dot-winged ant wren. The trail led uphill to a rocky outcrop, with views across the diminishing local forest. The habitat here was more open, so there was a different range of species to be found. Flycatchers were prominent, including variegated flycatchers, which given the numbers here may have been migrants from further south. An ochre lord flycatcher.
a brown crested flycatcher, a short crested flycatcher, similar but with an all dark bill and a no rufous in the tail. A forest elania, as the name suggests, typically associated with denser jungle where it is usually inconspicuous. And a rufous cassiornis. There was also a pair of white browed purple tufts. They're usually on or around the tops of bare or sparsely leaved trees. And just below them, a pied puffbird. Amongst a few hummingbirds was another male versicolored emerald. The patterning on the throat can be very variable. And a female black-throated mango with its distinctive black line running down the length of the underparts. In an adjacent area of scrub was a tooth-billed wren. With red-throated caracaras calling in the background. The caracaras were perched in larger trees behind the outcrop. Possibly on the lookout for paper wasps, their primary food source. Also here were a pair of lovely blue-necked tanagers. and an equally gaudy turquoise tanager. Joined by an immature male thick-billed euphonia. Whilst a king vulture soared imperiously overhead. Back down at the river, we found a striated heron with a recently caught fish. Soon followed by one of the highlights of the trip, a superb agami heron stalking prey along the riverbank. Probably the most ornate of all herons. Although they breed in rookeries, they are solitary feeders. However, that's normally along small, well-vegetated streams, so seeing this one in the open was exceptional. Having enjoyed prolonged views of the heron, it was back to the lodge.
on other boat excursions we simply explored the river itself. Close to the lodge were a series of rocky islands, favoured by a fairly approachable sunbitten. Sunbittens are the only member of their family, their closest living relative seemingly being the Kagu of New Caledonia in the southwest Pacific. They're widespread in forested habitats from Mexico south to Brazil, and although not particularly shy, don't always show as well as this. Nearby, an American black vulture came down for a drink. And an adult great black hawk was looking for food in trees along the riverbank. Just up river was an area of rapids with more islets. This was a regular site for a wintering spotted sandpiper and for a variety of swallows, with white-winged swallows. Flocks of white-banded swallows. A single black collared swallow, the only one seen on the trip. And southern rough-winged swallows. Maintaining the swallow theme was a swallow-winged puffbird. On the shoreline, a female anhinga was drying her wings. Like cormorants, their feathers are not waterproof. There were a pair of wary green ibis. and a stalking rufescent tiger heron. They can take up to four years to attain full adult plumage, and this one still showed some vestiges of immature tiger striping on the sides of the breast. We managed to drift near to a capped heron without disturbing it. Rather odd looking, widespread, but nowhere abundant. And also to a basking, spectacled caiman. So named because the bony protrusions around the eyes are supposed to resemble spectacles. And a resting capybara. Continuing along the river, we searched for more birds. Finding species like this male green and rufous kingfisher. An Amazonian oropendula. a drab water tyrant and a female yellow-throated woodpecker. Although the crown is red, the forehead is yellow and this would also be red on a male. In a couple of places along the river 
blinds have been placed near forest pools. One of the best birds seen being this female snow-capped mannequin coming to drink. Out on the river, it was important to keep an eye on the weather. Storm clouds would quickly build, requiring a hasty retreat back to the lodge before the deluge commenced. As the rain began to ease late afternoon, we were back out on the river, staying beyond dusk in search of night birds, and succeeding with a spotlighted boat-billed heron out in the open. Followed by a lovely bladder-tailed nightjar. confirmed as a male by white in the tail. The diagnostic three-pointed tail tip was just visible. And finally, a reclusive zigzag heron. before we retired to the lodge. South of the lodge and back on the main Teles Perez River, we spent a morning around Ariosto Island and its unique river island habitat. A trail leads through the main island where we found a Snethlager's toady tyrant. But our main quarry lay deeper within the island forest. Amazonian umbrella bird is a large crow-like Katinga and a specialist of these environments. This is a female lacking the male's flamboyant crest. We also found a female red-billed curassow. They had proved tough to see well, and this one soon disappeared. Back on the river, we searched out a few smaller islands. The rocky and sandy habitat is great for some specialist species, like the spotted toady flycatcher and Amazonian terrangulate, sometimes called Amazonian inetia to reflect its specific genus. On the sandy banks were pied lapwings. And amongst the rocks, roosting ladder-tailed nightjars. The females are darker and lack any obvious white in the plumage. The males are paler, with white in the wings and a white throat. Various trails lead directly from the lodge and are best explored at dawn. 
Not far from the lodge, we found this Alta Floresta ant pitter. endemic to Brazil's southern Amazon region and formerly considered conspecific with spotted ant pitta, but with a different call. Vocalizations play a key role in species level isolation of ant pitters. They habitually forage on the ground, using their feet to disturb and uncover arthropods. As the light improved, other species became a little easier to see. A good example was this male red-headed mannequin. Likewise, a gorgeous male black-throated trogon. Recent analysis has suggested the species be split and this form will be renamed as Amazonian black-throated trogon, recognising its core range. A plumbeous pigeon, common enough but usually very wary. And a ruddy-tailed flycatcher. Further along the trail was an area of forest that Brad hoped would produce a species we were very keen to see. Initially it remained stubbornly hidden, but with patience eventually showed well. A male chestnut-belted gnat-eater. Another form ripe for splitting this is proposed to become Snethlager's gnat eater. That was followed by a charming rufous necked puffbird. Like the gnat eater, this was to be the only one we saw on the trip. And finally, this cinnamon Attila. Other species seen along the forest trails included wedge-billed wood creeper and an Amazonian royal flycatcher. Of course, birds weren't the only life to be found in these magnificent forests. As well as huge K-pop trees, there were flowering jacarandas. Primates included brown capuchins. These are the monkeys often associated with organ grinders and are named because the cap of fur on the adults supposedly resembles the hood of a monk from the capuchin order. Plus white-cheeked spider monkeys. And like other primates, all spider monkeys lack thumbs. As this youngster shows, they use their hands as hooks 
and of course have very adaptable prehensile tails. Finally, this one of a family of white-nosed sakis. Endemic to southern Amazonian Brazil, very little is known about them in the wild. Foraging deep in the undergrowth were white-lipped peccaries. They can be aggressive, but when they don't feel threatened can be pretty relaxed. However, they make a very distinctive call when alarmed. Amongst a variety of insects was this striking morpho butterfly caterpillar. A white witch moth with its huge 12 inch wingspan. Streams of Birchall's army ants, here taking their grubs to a new nest site. And a tailless whip scorpion, actually a type of arachnid rather than a scorpion. And back near the lodge was this false coral snake. Cristalino has two canopy towers. The Ted Parker Tower is named after the famous American ornithologist who did so much for neotropical bird conservation. It was a long climb to the top for an obligatory dawn start. Amongst the first birds to show were a trio of red fan parrots. They were joined by a Cuvier's white-throated toucan. The parrots can assume a rather raptor-like silhouette, encouraging their alternative name of hawk-headed parrot. Nearby was a blue-headed parrot. And below the canopy, a female ringed woodpecker. This distinctive form is often now afforded species status as Amazonian black-breasted woodpecker. As the dawn mist dispersed, more species appeared, with superb views of a perched plumbeous kite. They often use perches like this to scan for insect prey. A white-browed hawk was a little less cooperative. Soon, a few curl-crested arasaris arrived. One amorous pair were involved in an obvious courtship ritual. The shiny and rather plastic looking head feathers are very distinctive when seen well.
Like all Arasaris, they are very sociable and a joy to watch. Later, a pair of red-necked Arasaris turned up. They're one of the least observed Arasaris, and little is known about their behaviour and breeding biology. A lettered Arasari completed a nice set of this appealing family of small toucans. Their name relates to the black markings on the base of the upper mandible, which have the appearance of a lettered script. Initially less visible was a male black girdled barbet, before it obligingly hopped into the open. The female is similar, but lacks the distinctive red cap of the male. A scan of the canopy revealed a smart male spangled Katinga. It eventually moved much closer. They are a classic bird of canopy towers, as the treetops are their favoured domain. Also here were bare-necked fruit crows. All were white-winged males, with the two on the left being immatures. A greater yellow-headed vulture was waiting for the sun's heat to create the right level of thermal uplift. Next, a red-throated piping guan. Its favoured perch later shared with a white-necked puffbird. Like the Katinga, it moved closer to the tower. One of the most widespread species of puffbird, with a range extending all the way from southern Mexico to these forests of the southern Amazon basin. Later in the morning more parrots appeared, starting with these koals parrots. Only described as recently as 1989 and until then considered an aberrant form of mealy parrot. And a pair of red and green macaws Also seen here was a male masked Tityra. A male short-billed honeycreeper. A male green honeycreeper. A very alert female blue Dacnis. A male rufous-bellied euphonia.
and a female yellow tufted woodpecker. As the heat increased and the sweat bees multiplied, it was time to return to ground level. We also made an evening visit to the same tower, although it was relatively quiet. One of the highlights was this bat falcon getting ready for an evening foray. And as dusk turned to night, a flash of distant lightning. The Chip Haven Tower is closer to the lodge. We also made a dawn visit here on our last morning at Cristalino. As with the Ted Parker Tower, the surrounding forest was a wonderful habitat for Arasaris. This time, red necked Arasaris led the way. A combination of bill pattern and red on the breast and nape is diagnostic. Not seen at the other tower, however, were these black necked Arasaris. A pair were present the only ones we were to see on the trip. Like the red-necked, the bill has a pale upper and darker lower mandible. The head and neck are however black, and there is a single chestnut band across the breast. They soon located one of the local fruiting trees. and curl-crested arasaris were here too. A red-throated caracara was perched on top of a broken tree branch. And a white-browed hawk showed marginally better, if more distantly, than from the Ted Parker Tower. Some trees were in flower, attracting more bird life. A paratic flycatcher was undoubtedly focused on the relative abundance of insects. As was a tropical kingbird. A palm tanager in the same tree was more interested in the fruits. Just below the canopy was a dwarf tyrant mannequin. A smart male orange-bellied euphonia was in the same area. joined by a pair of blue dacnis. Here showing better on their own, the female on the left and the male on the right. Also a female black-faced dacnis, looking very warbler-like. Further out was a male spangled Katinga. It was interesting to find this one calling, as they're rarely heard. And briefly, a rare yellow-shouldered grosbeak. Later in the morning, a few blue and yellow macaws arrived on the scene.
And finally, we had good views of crimson-bellied parakeets, a bird which until then we'd only heard. Not quite a Brazilian endemic, as their range extends into northern Bolivia. But like most parakeets, very vulnerable to habitat loss. Back at the lodge, we still had time for breakfast. Before it was time to leave Cristalino. However, we weren't finished yet. Leaving the lodge, we found this imposing female ornate hawk eagle perched above the riverbank. It then flew down across the river and caught a caiman. Unfortunately, it was largely obscured. However, it did then fly up into the trees, allowing for some amazing views. What a wonderful way to finish our stay at this brilliant lodge.